Welcome to Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Get ready. We're about to live in your head rent-free. Hello, Otterites. This is episode 144. I am Martin. And I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. All right, gentlemen, this is Pop Culture Rock Bands 2 Electric Boogaloo is yes. the title of this episode. That's a Martin-derived uh, title. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of one of those pop culture things of any time something's number two, you call it Electric Boogaloo for that movie Break In 2. Two, which had no reason to exist except they had to give it one. Yes. And that's why it was so, that. And this is just kind of that follow-on to uh, what was about this time last year, I guess. Ish. 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 Yeah. We do it about every year. Yeah, That's we right. did an episode where we just kind of kicked around about music and bands and... Formative stuff for us. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah, it's it's kind of tied to... We were talking about this in the show prep. 60s, 70s, 80s. Heavier on the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of where we go. And that's... You know, yes, there's a lot of great stuff before that. A lot of great stuff after that. Uh, See, I, I don't recognize much after, but... Well, and I'm, I'm trying... Both because I don't listen to it and because I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, admittedly, I haven't bought a new CD since probably 2001. Well, see, and you're showing your age there because nobody actually buys CDs anymore. Yeah, that's correct. There's, yes. there's, there is lots of great music out there. My children, my daughters in particular, all of my son as well, they will introduce me to some really great stuff because they were weaned on what I gave them. Uh, all, all the stuff we're talking yeah. about here, they, they knew that, so therefore anything that fits within that mold, and generally speaking, they don't break out of it. They like that mold. This is something you'll like, Dad. They've never steered it wrong. They've really come up with some really good ideas that they've brought out yeah. in, in, in various times. Yeah, uh, Bjorn and Ivar are definitely uh, falling off the tree here, or, or apples that didn't fall far from the trees. Um, they don't generally introduce me to anything new that I like. Uh, Bjorn right now is in this phase of listening to Japanese, uh, what do you call it, um, Japanese hip-hop. Okay. All right. It's well, unusual. <coughs> uh, it's Japanese rock type, but I mean, every song he plays for me sounds like a TV show theme song to me, so all I hear is the love boat, but in Japanese... <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry Bjorn I know uh, I, but now Ivar though is he is a 90's boy uh, he is currently buying up vinyl uh, his favorite is Green Day oh nice but they, they were they were 90's and, definitely. and Nirvana but he has he has Alanis Morissette on vinyl um, there's a, uh, a Nirvana poster now hanging up on the refrigerator in Nightfall uh, the bar uh, at Studio uh, M. So we're very much, uh, he's a very much a lithium fan on the Sirius satellite radio. Yes. So, you know, this thing with uh, our children, uh, generally the uh, millennial-ish, mm-hmm. uh, it's, I find it interesting that they have glommed on to vinyl because... Yes, my son has too. You know, I would not go back and... By eight tracks. <laughs> well, I mean, I mentioned... Or cassettes. This, right. You know, the ones on vinyl, and I mentioned this before, Bjorn bought a real live Sony Walkman disc, uh, uh, tape player, cassette tape player off of eBay and walks around Boo's campus with a real Walkman, just like we did in 1986. You know, that's fine. It's bizarre to me. Well, that, that, some, yeah. yeah, why would, why would you do When you that, have a phone uh, that, you know, has... Uh, not just several hundred gigabytes of storage, but also a data plan that lets you stream everything from the cloud. Yeah, because on a cassette, it's always the same order every single time. Well, see, now that doesn't bother me. Uh, after if the, it's an album that I want to list, listen to, or if it's an album, I, or if it's a tape I've put together, yeah. a mixed Well, that's correct. That's, it's, yeah, that's what I mean, that bothers what, me. Yeah, the idea of being a, you know, a mixed tape, but they're, they're, this generation's way of making a mixed tape, <laughs> he, he wants to... He wants to do the output from his computer into a cassette deck. I was doing that Every, in 1986. I mean, yeah. Yeah, but, but we were doing it from, you know... Uh, we were doing it from other cassettes and from vinyl. We Absolutely. were taking... Uh, what I used to do, um, you know, you could do this even on video cassettes and just run like a CD out to a video cassette in. 
Sure. Right, just, just to do the audio. Yeah. Just do the audio and have six hours of continuous audio on a on a, a video yeah. cassette tape. Right, and Absolutely. just pop it into VCR and and play. Now it that's back. all on YouTube. Yeah. Well, it's not even that because you know yeah. he wasn't even doing videos; it was just the audio. Well, exactly. It was just the audio from yeah. sure. CDs, yeah. but it was a way that if you had people over, you didn't have to change the CD. You right. could put the you had back six then, hours. You know, you know, being able to, to afford a five disc changer was, you know, that's, yeah. and still, that only got you like three hours of, of right. music. Right, you still had to change them out. Yeah. But this was, yeah, I mean, you could have six hours on the video cassette uh, true without having to touch it. Yeah. yeah. There, you know, again, like the cassette, though, it's always the same songs in the same order. That was the great thing about the multi disc changers, is you could randomize it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Of course, you'd have that, you know, 10 second pause as it, you know, rotated around the thing and tried to find a song that it wanted to play for you. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but you know, it's just, it's kind of like that, uh, you know, uh, let's all get the same tattoo so we can show how we're individuals. Yes. You know, it's, I, I, personally, I, as much as I liked getting the vinyl in the day, because, and I did it for this, because I would then make a copy of the cassette, uh, onto cassette. Absolutely. To listen to, because I didn't take a you know disc player uh, yeah, into yeah. the car with me, but also it preserved the best quality copy of the song mm-hmm. for later copying. You know, you, most of the vinyl that I have has only been played a couple of times. Yes, because I didn't listen to it on the record. Player. Well, I mean that's what pirating meant before Napster and the internet. Right, that meant you copied other people's music. Right, from somebody cassette would loan you their cassette, and if you had a dual deck player. Then you, you just copied, copied their cassette. I mean, that's right. what oh, we or did at one time. Was, usually it was the vinyl you borrowed, and then you, you would make yeah, it. And I mostly did cassettes yeah. by the time I got around Yeah, to by it. the time you get into the, to in the, the 90s, us, yeah. everybody's doing Oh, by then, absolutely, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, people would bring cassettes to work and say, here, take this home, and you would copy it and bring it back. And then right. you would bring them one. Exactly. And, you know, that was... But we also recognized that by the time you... You know, made, you know, if you were getting a copy of a copy of a copy, that your sound quality was suffering. Yeah. So it was all analog. Yeah. That was the great thing about CDs. Your, you know, unless you scratch yes. the the CD, yeah. your audio quality was always perfect. Yeah. yeah. I do not believe that audio sounds better on a vinyl. No, I just don't. No, I don't either. Yeah, I mean, it's it could be warmer. Sounding depending on what you're playing it back on. Well, that's your speakers. And a, but a that's, little less sterile, but well, but again, I think that's. Uh, I don't know that. Uh, yeah, I don't. Really, I don't understand it either. I, mean, I really don't. Again, my vinyl's all tucked away somewhere, and I'm pulling stuff off of Spotify. Right. They do too. Yes, my son listens to the, the boy listens to Spotify. He loves it. Now, yeah. He's got an iPhone. Yeah. And plus his school iPad, although. Yeah. Um, I think they let them put Spotify on the iPad, but not like iMessage. And yeah. so the kids at, at DeSales are they're constantly sharing uh, playlists and stuff. And you know, uh, the eldest daughter she shares playlists with him. And yeah, uh, so you know, I keep trying to tell him, you know, Apple Music, which I've got the Apple subscription. Because again, even though I hate the company, the software and the way the hardware works, I do like. I just hate the company. Uh, and yes, that's my way of rebelling, I guess. I don't know. Well, that's pretty good, Robert. Let's, well, what I'm, uh, but I hadn't finished the thought yet. So, okay. yeah, right. yeah, yeah, so yeah, you're yeah. still rebelling. So, so well, the, the boy, you know, we're talking about Spotify and how that's what uh, he listens to and the girls listen to. But I, I, when I share music with him, because he and I like a lot of similar music. Mm-hmm. He got uh, some rock band t-shirts for Christmas, by the way. Mm-hmm. I would have gotten him different ones, but that's all right. But you know, one of the ones he did want was Nirvana. Uh, yeah. You know, he I think he got a Led Zeppelin from uh, from Aunt Trish, and uh, a couple and, and something else I forget. But you know, we've got the Apple Music, and it's like, son, you, you got an iPhone. I've shared the subscription with you. Yeah. Why do we have to pay for Spotify? Said, well, that's what all my friends use. And it's like, well, they've got iPhones too. Why can't you share? St-? But whatever. Yeah. But you know, that's how they primarily I think how they listen to stuff. But they once they get money, they they. They're nostalgic. They're nostalgic for things that they never experienced, which, in a way, is a lot like some traditional Catholics, uh, which I'm okay yeah. with. You know, and, again, right? I have no explanation for this fascination with vinyl and audio cassettes and, and Walkmans. 
Because, again, they didn't experience it. It's our nostalgia that right. they're glommed on to. Those so are now. things I have no desire to, to revisit. I, and I don't know why. I guess maybe it feels more real to them that way well, than, and than a Spotify playlist. It's like kicking the tires? Yeah, it, it's yeah. a feeling of ownership of it. Yeah, that could we, be. We used to do that. I mean, that was, Right, we've already had that when experience. When we bought an album, when we bought a CD or a cassette. It was part of our a, collection. Yeah, we had a feeling of ownership. Almost well, just like a book. I was just saying, just like our books, we like to see them on the shelf. Who yeah. didn't like to see all their CDs or their videotapes or their movies lined up on the shelf? Yeah, yeah. So, so bands, landmark bands that we didn't cover before. You mentioned one, Nirvana. Mm-hmm. Very mm-hmm. important band. Um, being a hard rock guy, I mean, I remember the you're era, metalhead. Yeah, so I remember the era very well. I'm in the I think I mentioned this in our, our first rock band. There, there's kind of this split in the '80s of heavy rock. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, the you go down the Motley Crue, Poison, Winger, uh, Warrant path, Bon Jovi path, uh, lots of hair, polka dots, choreography. You know, you're stuffing your jeans with tube socks on one hand, and then there's the Metallica. Anthrax, the thrash metal Iron branch Man. on the other hand. Yeah. Well, this is even... Later in Yeah, this becomes that because metal's kind of together at that point. You know, there's a there's a flow from Black Sabbath to Maiden to Judas Priest to even Quiet Riot in the early 80s. You know, even to... And that, that kind of that explosion, Scorpions... I mean, there's a point in, in 1984, that summer, you know, the sun wouldn't come up unless the Scorpion said it was okay to. So... It's the year I saw them. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, July 4th weekend. Yeah, uh-huh. and, that's, that's and summer. summer of 84. Yeah, we were there. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, Ozzy's huge. But then that's when that split occurs. And they were selling. I mean, that stuff sold. Right. Um... Winger and and Poison all so, that sold, but then when Nirvana hits, everything changes. And I, I'm trying to remember this the sequence, but if I remember right, December of 1990, like the number one album is a Michael Jackson album. The number it's one probably album, like one of the last times you could ever say that. Yeah, the number one album in January of '91 is Nirvana. Hmm. That's how quick everything happened. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, literally, people were taking the Michael Jackson album that they got for Christmas back to the store and buying the Nirvana album in January. And it's just, you knew it was different from the moment you heard it. You knew, mm-hmm. okay, this is a change. This is, this, everything is now different. So why do you think that is? What is it about Nirvana and the stuff that comes after uh, that is different? Besides the aesthetics, because obviously you've got that all the visuals and all yes. the all the stuff that almost seems like it's designed to appeal to the the MTV. Let's get on the video, you know, yeah. music video stuff. Because why do you need all that if it's not for the videos? The aesthetics are an important part of it. Mm-hmm. Because again, you go from these guys wearing spandex to three dudes in jeans and sweaters playing. But I think the biggest part was the that stuff that that puff metal became so juvenile. There's nothing to it. Okay. It's oh, it's twelve year old girl music. Okay, so there's there's no depth to the there's lyrics. No, the the lyrics mean nothing. Yeah. It's, uh, was it, uh, the Disney Channel of its time, only not yeah. quite as young. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, record, you know, they understood that there was a market to teenage girls that this stuff sold to. And when Nirvana hits, then they discover, oh, there's a market that wants something else, and that something is very personal. It's angsty 
became the word, you mm-hmm. know. The 90s are full of angst. Why? I don't know. I don't know, because if anything, you know... It should have been a joyous time, it, but exactly. it's full of angst. But you know what? In a way, that's uh, that's almost the uh, the rebellion of its day. Yeah. Because, you know, when you think about uh, the 60s and the, especially the early 70s and that drug culture, that's very much a rebellion against the, the, the day, the, yeah. the mores of the day. When you look at all that flashy crap that was going on, whether it's in a little bit more, not necessarily mainstream, but uh, uh, regular, I don't know if there's a yeah. better term, pop rock uh, stuff, whether it's... I'm all... to choose the right audio apps for you. Really, I'm not talking to you about that. Uh, see, Siri, they don't always work, the software doesn't always work as well as it should. Yeah, but... screw off, Siri, we're yeah. busy. Um so, the the stuff that was going on, you know, it's kind of a, uh, you can make the argument that all that 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 visual aesthetic stuff that was going on in the the, the spandex and the the twisted sister and the makeup and, and yeah. what have you, all that stuff is kind of a rebellion against the straight laced conservatism of the eighties. So then, when you have what is essentially a pretty damn prosperous time, uh, literally following on on the the eighties. And, yeah. you know, you've got this generation right. coming in. It's like, well, you know, gosh, what do I have to... I need to be worried about something, damn yeah. it. Well, and you have all this music in the 80s uh, influenced by the continent, by European yes. attitudes towards the Cold War. And by 91, that's all lifted. Yeah. yeah. So where does... Where does so what do we get to know, protest? We're, we're not... You know, we're not sitting under the shadow of somebody's thumb ready to launch nuclear missiles... Hey, you, you silly punks! Stuff should be awesome, but they needed that angst. Well, you know that's, and I think that that whether you call it angst or that rebelling against uh, or rejection, I, I should say, yes, a rejection of, of whatever is currently uh, considered mainstream, uh, which is usually you know by your your parents or their peers. Uh, you know that that looking for that angst is kind of that, and it's like, well, things can't be that good. Yeah. Uh, you might also argue that it's a it's a result of too much prosperity. Because I mean, look at look at the world today. Uh, you know, the last couple of years aside, uh, and some of the the uh, financial troubles that the the country has seen here and there have been the exception uh, for the last thirty yeah. years. We've had a very prosperous. Yeah. Society and economy since 1982, and for the most part, it is built upon itself until you know. Really, the the especially the 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 2010s are the exception to that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I don't mean just the latter part. I mean the whole thing. Yeah, the whole thing. And so, if when you're relatively prosperous, the only way to reject that is to get angsty about stuff that's made up. And when you see what's going on now, I think a lot of that today. Is a rejection. Now, it used to be just to be on the general society. You know, now it's a little bit more targeted. Mm-hmm. But not. I don't pay that much attention to current music, so I don't know if current music is. Yeah, I mean, no one. It, it, but it, it parallels the '60s to a degree. Yeah, I mean, you think about what's popular in 1964, 65. Is I want to hold your hand, and you know, we're going to the sock hop together. But by 68 and 69, it's... Yellow Submarine. Yeah, you know, <laughs> four dead in Ohio. But, you know, yeah. by 71, you know, you're talking about the Kent State uh, death of four college students has made its way into popular music. Yeah. Or, you know, uh, anything, you know, the Charles Manson uh, taking yeah. over Helter Skelter. Yes. So uh, it... Uh, <coughs> You know, it's not a drug influence change, I, I don't think, but it's it's an there's a feeling of being unfulfilled, even though in the midst of total fulfillment. Yeah, in the midst of what should be this hugely hopeful moment, no more specter of nuclear annihilation. Yet it's unfulfilling. I think there's two and, things going on there. Yeah, I think part of that is the natural uh, need or the natural. Uh, Outgrowth, perhaps, is a better way to put it, of the creative person. 
Yes. They are a, they're just a, a little, when I say they, I also mean us, because uh, we have people sitting in the room that are very creative in multiple ways. I think so. Uh, they are very much, uh, not always suffering, but there tends to be, especially amongst the true geniuses, a suffering. Whether you want to call that a mental illness or just a uh, inability to deal yeah. with things as they are. Yeah, a feeling that there's something underneath all the good stuff that's still awful. Right, that right. There is still an awfulness to the human condition that needs to be brought forward. So, uh, and it became a time of, of great songwriting. Again, Nirvana does put a stake in the ground and the record industry does change. And it leads to Green well, Day and mm-hmm. uh, Soundgarden and Atlantis, Atlantis Morissette, Morissette yeah. and, and these incredible bands all through the 90s and into the beginning of the 2000s. The record industry tumps it all over for, you know, boy bands. Right. Um, again, the or, you know, also music. Britney Spears and Taylor Swift and, yeah. you know, whoever else. So, but, you know, and... There's there's that going on. I think it's also just uh, an outgrowth of rejection, uh, not just rejection of uh, society, but you get to a certain point and it's like, you know, aren't we done with what those guys were doing? We got to do something totally we different. We got to do something different, yeah. Like, uh, that's kind of where that's laid out. At, yeah. 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 So, it, you know, in a way, it's rejecting uh, it, what's well, kind of like the punks in the mid 70s. Yeah. You know, they're rejecting society. As well as the music that has gone before. Yeah. And in the early 70s, music becomes this jazz-influenced, Steely Dan, Alan Parsons project. It's huge. It's nine-minute songs. and Right. It's, more, it's literally life. the music. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily any message with the music or anything, but yeah, you know, musicians, they were the, the, the bomb. And, and a band like the Ramones chunks that over and says, rock and roll was supposed to be Two minutes and a lot of attitude. Right. And not a nine minute journey into jazz fusion. Yep. Mm. So so that's another land you know, a hugely landmark band very parallel to Nirvana that really tumps everything over uh, at a, at a specific moment. Yeah. That really you know, really kind of ends one phase of popular music and moves into another because once punk really takes hold, once new wave, we talked about Blondie in the first episode, Mm -hmm. once that takes hold, then yeah, a lot of that stuff, that arena rock, is gone. I mean, it it just does not, it's just not appealing anymore. There are standouts. I mean, you know, Queen is still doing that style of stuff. Uh for quite some time, but but they trimmed their sales a little bit. They too, did, yeah, and, and got back to kind of funkier type, shorter stuff, you know, in the in the late seventies. Right, but you know, they 80s. still. I mean, they were the, pardon the pun, the king of the the uh, the yeah. rock opera kind of a thing. Yeah, but they um, they would go on to do kind of uh, uh, Highlander. No movie? more more disco influenced more. Um, Rockabilly influence, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know. Um, well, you they, know, you, they, what is the song uh, that's very rockabilly kind of influence that Queen released? Um, uh, sorry, not not. I don't know. Uh, Mrs. Robert could probably tell you. Um, it's one we know, though, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I've got a couple of uh, Queen songs in my uh, but like playlist, they're, they're, but that's you know, yeah. Fat Bottom Girls and Mr. Roboto. That's that sticks. sticks. Sticks, sorry, sticks. Um, what was the other one I got in my... Crazy uh, Little Thing Called Love. Oh, yeah, Is yeah. the more rockabilly influence. Yeah. And again, yeah. their album Hot Space is more of a kind of a dance-influenced yeah. record. So they were able to but they, more from that. And they're still it. from that, that age of theme albums. Uh, you know, so... Yeah. But anyways, you know, it, honestly... I'm not a huge Nirvana fan. You know, I can recognize the, the influence. But again, by the time, you know, really, once the 80s are over, there's not a whole... I mean, I listened, whatever I listened to that, was, that I was listening to in college, yeah. I continued to listen to. Yeah, I mean, part of not this pick up a new you stuff. were already there because you were already a new wave punk That's guy. true. That's true. Uh-huh. Uh, which, you know, um, 
Again, I'm you know I'm in that branch with Megadeth, Metallica, Anthrax, heavy heavy stuff, and understood. Okay, this is going to be a huge turn, and then it follows on with Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam. Yeah. These these are Not other have- things that I've I've got into and appreciated and bought. Now, I besides, did buy some of those. Yeah, I, mean, besides, I got some Pearl Jam. I got an Alice in Chains. I got some Gene Loves Jezebel, Green Day. I got a Weezer CD around here somewhere. <laughs> you know. uh, in addition to the other stuff that I was buying. Mm-hmm. So that's, I mean, that, that hits a couple of the biggies that were transformative. Nirvana, Ramones. Yeah. Love the Ramones. Uh, I think we've already talked about Blondie and the Clash. Yeah. And transformative acts. So Francis, though, uh, yeah, you've been you're very much silent. more of a traditional rock and roll oh, guy. Oh, ab- absolutely. You're a, you're a Fleetwood Mac. Uh, very much He's so. a corporate rock kind of guy compared to us. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the, but there's, you, a cu- there's, a, there's a couple major names we haven't ever mentioned that I think have some, has some influence. One of them is uh, they still have influence today, even, even though one of them hasn't performed since 1980, and that's Led, the first one is Led Zeppelin. Yes. Which was an enormous shift change. I mean, they essentially have 10 years, give yes. or take. Yes. And it, they well, are, that's about average, I think, for bands that make it big. You get about 10 years. Anything beyond that is really unusual. Well, and that was, uh, and that the Rolling Stones as being an exception to that was yes. another one we haven't talked much about. But I think Led Zeppelin deserves, it almost deserves its own thing. They changed so much yeah. because they are, they are very lyric oriented. And they are also yeah. very guitar oriented. And, and they're one of the first ones to really be able to dictate almost to a record company what they were going to do and when. Right. You know, they were able to kind of say, no, we're not going to rush right back out on the road. We're taking a break here. The Beatles had a little bit of influence at that because by that time the Beatles has, they, of course, they waned. But yeah. they were at the end. Beatles does. We'll do what we want. Thank you very much. Yeah. And Zeppelin comes along with their first album, and they realize everybody goes nuts for it because well, there's nothing else like it. When bands start to say things like "We'll do what we want," mm-hmm. is generally when they start their decline. In this case, that was not the case, though. Uh, Zeppelin really was. I'm talking about the Beatles. Oh, you're right. In the case of the Beatles, yeah. you're exactly right. Yes. Yeah. So uh, yeah, because they've made it big. Yeah. And then when they start saying we're going to do, it, that's generally when bands will. They lose it mm-hmm. because they don't have the discipline to keep working at what they were doing. Generally, well, that's right. That's why well, you there, get. There was definitely. That's why you get Magical Mystery Tour and the White Album. Uh, some people love White Album. I yeah. think it's really it's kind of a hot mess in many ways. And Magical Mystery it's Tour is supposed to be the biggest thing ever. You know, yeah. I mean, Sergeant like, Pepper's is was there. Let's turn. Let's change this all forever. Yes. And after that, it kind of like they never. Abbey Road was great. Let it be was great, but they never really were as mass market after it that. It got a little, especially compared to the early stuff. You know, you start talking about Let It Be. You're really looking at that that '60s hippie, almost folky mm-hmm. kind of. Very much so, and that's what they're stuff. they're playing what they wanted to. And right. Which you know, people don't want to hear the new stuff you write. Yeah. They want to hear you do the old stuff. Well, that's because exactly that's right. what they. Because I mean, that's why I listen to all the stuff from the eighties. Mm-hmm. I don't care about the new stuff. I like what I like, well, and that's what I want to listen. And to. sometimes that's a huge. I mean, the, Hank Williams Jr. is a great example yeah. of that. You know, he couldn't make it on his own until he broke away from his father's mm-hmm. legacy, like Hank Williams Jr. Oh, Hank Williams, totally yes. different area. Yeah. But he could. He, the only reason he existed, and he would tell you this, is to play his daddy's stuff, and he got. You know, it almost destroyed him with the expectations. It's only when he broke away and said, "No, by God, I'm doing my own stuff," that it but changed. There was there was a rhythm to the music business in the late '60s, early '70s, especially for rock bands. Yeah, and it was it was brutal. Uh, Sabbath, Zeppelin, a lot of these bands went through the same thing of writing an album, recording an album, tour, writing an album, recording an album, tour, really without stopping. Right. I mean, that's. When you think you about make, it, let, you got to maximize the money because that's right. what the record companies were doing. Right, because there was they, no money in touring really back then. Right, because you could all that was two hundred fifty dollars a seat. Right, back the, then the only reason you toured was to get people to go out and buy the album to buy the new record. Right, so you know again you talk about like Led Zeppelin public or put out four records from like nineteen sixty nine to nineteen seventy one. Yeah, that's unheard of. It's, today. it's just like well, a lot yeah. of that was kind of pent up. But you're right. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, but it's also it's 
it, it's pushed in that there's no way to keep you out there anymore mm-hmm. if you don't. There's there, there's no going on tour without a record to promote. There's there's no way to make money if you don't have new material out there. So they, they push these bands, and it burned them up. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the Eagles are famous for this as well. I mean, they got pushed and made album after album after album throughout the 70s and just burned out to the point where they were ready to kill each other. Yeah, and, and, they, um, and they they didn't break up. They just took a hiatus for 14 years, <laughs> as, as Henley would say when they came back. Uh, but that's... But, I mean, there's a reason that album's called Hell Freezes Over. That's because it wasn't supposed to ever happen. Yeah, because yeah. they said, we'll, we'll get back together when Hell Freezes Over. Right. So Well, eventually, you dangle a big enough check in front of somebody... Hell will freeze over. Yeah. And, and they're kind of the band that started this idea of we could go out on a tour without new music and because charge a bazillion dollars a, a seat and make a whole pound full of money off of it. Well, because they had the back catalog. Well, they had a back yeah. catalog, but there was also the pent up, oh man, wouldn't it be great if yeah. those guys got back wouldn't together? Wouldn't it be great if the Eagles got back together? Right. Because no matter, because if you, if you break up or you stop recording new music, when you're on top, mm-hmm. then you guarantee that you can come back 10 or 15 years later and make a buttload of money yeah. because people were waiting for the yeah. next if, thing. If you aren't dead. Assuming, well, 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 that's why the Beatles never That did. doesn't matter. Yeah, and it's I mean, the Grateful Dead, I'm pretty sure they were dead the last five years they were touring. <laughs> yeah. But, but, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Zeppelin is a, is a, is a cornerstone band of rock and roll. Again, the the live spectacle. The craft that they the did. There's nothing ship. like them. Yep. And to be honest, I'll give, I'll lay, I love them all. They all contributed. They were all necessary. But really, if you want to lay at the feet of one genius, it's Jimmy Page. I'm going to say Wiley Coyote. Yeah. No. Super well, genius. It, it, Jimmy Page Jimmy is Page, probably yeah. the most innovative, the most talented, and I don't like to put oppositional relationships yeah. out here, but he is he is so innovative. So much of what made Zeppelin work so well is tied up in Page's guitar work. Yeah, well, you know, that's... And, and Plant's vocals helped. They were... Well, and, and Plant, Robert Plant is the prototypical rock and roll front man. Yes, very much. So. He's very different. As, as much as Mick Jagger was as well, Plant's the first guy basically going out on stage with a shirt on. Yeah, you know, and, and and being that guy in the blue jeans and and you know the the blonde, handsome guy with long hair in front of in front of the stage with a very different voice. Jagger's got some of that too. It's yeah. it's a very it's a it's a but unique it, voice. But Plant's even different from say other charismatic frontmen of that era like uh, Jim Morrison. Oh yeah. I mean yeah. Morrison's this taciturn, I'm behind the mic. I might unzip my pants and get arrested for it. But Plant's out there. He's Performing, he, he is. He in, is in a way singing. that's different from the other guys. That's right. Yeah, and, I, and you, you you bring up a great band as well, The Doors, which we haven't even talked about. Yeah. Uh, just kind of. Well, you know, you want to talk about uh, before we go there. Before we go there, let's do a bourbon break. Yes, it's let's right. do a bourbon. We're break. at the at so, a mark. Uh, I have changed the uh, bourbon that I am drinking uh, today uh, for this episode. I've been doing uh, the. Uh, uh, See, so what did I do first? Well, oh, I did the Trader Joe's earlier. That's right, you did. And then I did the uh, uh, Knob Creek Nine Year, which so good. So uh, changed it up, went back to the uh, Jim Beam Black. There you go. We haven't had uh, that in some time, and not in some time. And you know, dropped an ice cube in there so that uh, it makes it uh, palatable. Because like the Trader Joe's, you need to chill it and add a little bit of water to to, to get it to work really, really well. Uh, and I'm and I'm liking it. It's a very good one. Well, I mean, uh, hey, uh, we've used it before. I've had it. I liked it. I thought it was very good. It's very different, too, uh, compared to some of the stuff we have. And uh, my vow is by the time we record back at my place again, I'll have some new stuff for, Excellent. Us, for, for us to work through. But sometimes you got to go with your old favorite. And I'm sticking with that 1792, partially because I don't have it at home. You have it here, uh, and uh, I, for, I forgot how much of a love affair I had with that. Yes, one. this is one of one of our early uh, bourbons that we latched onto. With Very the much so, yes. Uh-huh. And it, it, it is it is it is reliable. It is smooth. It is sophisticated. It's quality stuff. Quality. There's the word. Quality. Yes, we're loving that. So that's that's where I'm going. Neat, as as I've been doing most everything lately. Yeah. So I am taking my last uh, snort here of the Four Roses Small Batch. 
Ah, excellent, excellent. We all, uh, you know, you just mine probably it. has the most bite, but, uh, you know, really, you, you let enough, even though this is only an 86 proof, uh, which is not high high volume of alcohol at all. all right. uh, it's all very, very, you know, sliver higher than, than most. Uh, it, it really is a, a, a good, uh, good sipping bourbon once you've released that flavor with the, the chill in the water. Uh, before we go on any farther, uh, since this is the pop culture episode, I yeah. uh, want to make a uh, uh, it's kind of a correction, mm-hmm. but just an acknowledgement. Our last pop culture episode, we did Looney Tunes. Yeah. So we made what is nearly an unforgivable sin. We did, yeah. Uh, we yeah. did not mention the great Mel Blanc. We did. The we voice so of much. nearly every great character that the Looney Tunes, Looney Tunes and Mary I don't see how we what, got through yeah, that. One of history's great voice actors. Yeah, yeah, it's probably the best voice actor ever. That's right. He could do so many different things. Uh, all of those uh, Looney Tunes, Mary Melody's voices are male blank. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, he, and he was just phenomenal. His son uh, later picked up the mantle and no, uh, yeah. did uh-huh. uh, some of the voices for uh, later versions. And he was close. About as close as you could possibly get uh which is great. Yeah, I mean, genetically, you know, you figure that's probably your best shot anyways. But, uh, yeah, so uh, overlooked on our part. Uh, mea culpa. Mea, mea culpa, yes. Mea right. culpa, mea maxima, maxima culpa. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, because we, we, we hit, uh, we mentioned the directors as uh, like Chuck Jones and Robert McKinson. Chris Freeling, yeah. Chris Freeling as, as creators. Chuck, yeah, Charles McKinson. Uh, and forgot that, but, it's, but it's and he's consistent to, through the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah there's very like little. Voice. I think very early on, uh, he was not involved. But yeah. what really brought them truly to life was the great Mel Blanc. That's correct. I could have my timeline yeah. wrong there, but I'm pretty sure he was not the original voice on some of them. But at its height, he certainly was. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just, uh, you know, that these characters were the other than what. No, uh, no, they all. Even Sylvester, Tweety, all of them all had voices. So they're all anthropomorphized. Yeah, yes. As opposed to say Tom and Jerry from MGM, or you know, Pluto did yeah. not have a voice. Yeah, even the, some of the Disney Mickey had a voice, but it's not. You know, there's there's not this wide range of all these characters with voices the same way in, in Disney or MGM. Right, and they weren't all done by the same person. Yeah. Yeah, That's what makes him such a yeah, great yeah. performer. So, so yeah, uh, of course, you know, Goofy and uh, Daffy and and or, or I'm sorry, Donald, Donald, Donald Duck, yeah, Donald yeah. Duck and Scrooge McDuck. They're they're anthropomorphized and have voices, but right, it's just but, not. But the, the fact that one guy did yeah. all of those Looney yeah. Tunes voices, and he, he hated carrots. <laughs> and he hated carrots. Yeah, he hated carrots. He'd have to chew on them and he'd spit them out after he would uh, after we would do that. It was just a not a thing for him. But uh, yeah, so. Uh, our apologies to the, the great Mel Blanc. Yeah, and his a salute to Mel Blanc uh, to go with our Looney Tunes episode. But. Yeah, right. So uh, back to uh, Rock Bands Two, Electric Boogaloo. <clears throat> you know, so we spent a lot of time talking about Nirvana and and stuff that went on there in the late '80s, uh, early '90s with with that changeover. And you know, we haven't really talked about really. I mean, it's still somewhat of a progression. You know, Nirvana and and grunge. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah we didn't say really, the word grunge, but we should have. Yeah, we should right. have, because they are the progenitor, really, of grunge as a popular movement. I'm sure they were not the first uh, garage band out of Seattle that, that became grunge, but obviously they're the, the first well-known. Yeah, I mean, it was a scene where there were lots of the same bands, but at, like anything, once Nirvana sells, <laughs> then right. it was, oh, we could sell this? And they rushed in, the, the record companies rushed in, signed basically every Seattle band there was, right. and, and started pushing them. Because they were they were kind of afraid to sell this material at first. Right, because yeah. it was different. Because, you know, and just like any corporate entity, they are risk-averse. And when you consider how much money goes into yeah. uh, producing an album and promoting it, that's yeah. understandable. That's right, because yeah. in many respects... They have to have a little bit against that because it's a continually evolving market. The visionaries get that. But if they were, you know, you would never have gotten Nirvana if they weren't willing to take some sort of a chance. Right. There are or a Led things. Zeppelin, which was very different. Right. You know, you, but, to, you know to give them a, a platform is is quite a bit of a thing yeah. here. Yeah. I, 
But, but it's interesting Zeppelin, thing to me. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry go ahead. Uh, for Zeppelin, though, there's kind of a known quantity a little bit because this is they're evolving from the Yardbirds. And yes. similar acts of that same period. Well, that, you're kind of going to a similar place where I Emily wasn't... Uh, Different era, but same uh, different era, but same concept. Because mm-hmm. you're going to see this concept all the time. Uh, whenever there is a pivot, uh, that pivot often returns to an earlier era, and that's what grunge is. A lot of people will tell you grunge, uh, at the very least, has similar uh, themes, roots, whatever you want to put it. Whether they are trying to uh, uh, echo that directly. But a lot of people will tell you that grunge takes them back to early punk new wave. Yes, yes. So I, I get that tie, like I get to the Ramones, that tumping over the apple cart, yeah. and rock and roll is supposed to be personal and about your feelings, and two and a half minutes long. Right. Not because yeah, when we're talking about grunge, we're not going to say personal and fun like we did with the Ramones, but you know, because yeah. you don't associate. You know, Nirvana and fun in that same way. But, you know, the yeah, Ramon songs like Beat on the Brat. Yeah. You know, that's that's not a fun... Ha- that's not I Want to Hold Your Hand. That's that's not, hey, let's go out with 18-year-old girls song. Like, you know... Right, right. Where do you get to, again, Poison or something like that? Um, that's well, you not... Know, you know, that's, it's... It's, a, it's an everything Deals with terrible. some themes that, yeah. Well, you know, you look at um, a lot of the... So you, you guys know I'm a big Susie and the Banshees fan. And you look at some of the songs that uh, that they did. You know, some of them are very nonsensical. Uh, for instance, Hong Kong Garden, I think we talked about the last time. Literally, it's named after a Chinese restaurant that they went to around the corner from wherever they were. <laughs> and, and, you know, that... A good Chinese restaurant is an inspirational thing. That's yes. right. You know, it might have been called China Inn if they'd lived here. That's right. Uh, but, you know, there's one song, uh, Spellbound, and, you know, it talks about uh, Possessed Doll, uh, and talking about this uh, uh, red doll uh, dance, and uh, talking about if your elders don't say their prayers, you take them by the legs and throw them down the stairs, and then you hear the drums doing this boom, 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 you know. Is this pre Chucky? Uh, yes, <laughs> I think it is. That's uh, I uh, and, you know, there's. they When you have this pivot, I, you know, I think you'll often have this kind of thing. They'll start dealing with topics that are not very yes. uh, acceptable. Now, it's not always topics because, you know, you want to go a little bit earlier from even the eras we've talked about. You look at Elvis Presley, and he was well, one of the early sexualized. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yes. he was, you know, in a and, time where you just don't do that. Right. So he wasn't necessarily doing a lot of different topical stuff, although Jailhouse Rock would have been. Uh, a very, you know, we don't we don't talk about that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, that's that's bad guys. Yeah, and so you know he he was very much in the same genre. You know, he tipped over the whole thing, started something brand new. Yeah, and he, of course he got enough clout to be able to do that along the way too. That, that yeah, that has a lot to do with that. Well, you know, uh, there was a an undercurrent in the fifties of rebellion that it, it doesn't get a whole lot of play because that Happy Days image. Is so well, much more. You're talking about Marlon Brando, the wild one. Well, there's Marlon Brando. There's the sexualized uh, hips of Elvis Presley. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, you got the whole beatnik culture. That's true. That's true. Uh, you've got the subversive comic books and that's uh, right. reefer madness. Uh, you know all these things that that uh, are subtly brewing in the background, and you know there's such a culture shift between mm-hmm. the 30s and 40s. And the 50s and 60s. It's yeah. not just a generational thing. Uh, it really was a transformative cultural shift. And I don't know that you can tie it entirely to World War II, but that's generally our demarcation because it's such a huge cultural yeah. event where some of it things are so different before and so different after. The advent of television had a lot to do with it. Television does have a yeah, lot to do yeah, with it. I mean, the, the advent of new forms of media that are more immediate... Yes, is important because even though those elements don't necessarily come directly to an audience, a large audience, but they can influence those who do write for larger audiences. Mm-hmm. You know, again, where do you get jokes to for the Dick Van Dyke show? Well, maybe the writer knows somebody who's a jazz musician, and you find some way to sanitize 
that material right and right. put it in and sneak it in there again what would happen with the monkeys we talked about yes you know uh, Michael Nesmith's recent death that was sanitized and campy but it's being influenced by the counterculture by the drug culture um, which is very ironic because they're, they're, you know, it's put together they're by these very straight laced TV and record yeah, executives it's being slipped in a little bit and, and that brings down barriers to a degree yeah um so yeah you know very often a lot of this stuff is a reaction now we we didn't really talk about this guy but you know i want to throw this out there because again it's another game changer and that's Jimi hendrix Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know if you want to talk about one of the most influential yet short-lived careers which is such a shame yeah the man was an absolute musical Genius, yes. like Jimmy Page. I mean, he he was a yeah. Mozart level yeah, genius, that's in right. my opinion. Yeah, uh, his it, ability to play and the things he was willing to do, and the fact he was a black man, uh, all were, just, you know, all of those things worked against him, but all those things worked for him too. And he was just he was a phenomenal. Yeah, figure. The, the the biggest black rock and roll star since Chuck Berry. Yeah. 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 Um, well, and you know, pretty and, much and, after. I mean, yeah. I, I bet you get to to the Jackson, Michael Jackson, when he really becomes in the '80s his his own standalone star. And even then, it's not the same kind of rock and roll. No, it's not. It's not. It, it's, it's a not very a guitar. Driven. It's a. It's not quite bubblegum rock, but it's not far. Depending on what it is. Yeah. Because I mean, he did deal with some serious themes. Uh, yeah. Billie Jean. Yeah. You know, that's uh, that was that was, he had. That was post thriller though. Or, no, no, no. Or Billie was, Jean was, yeah, that uh, was just before. Just off the before. wall. That was off the wall, uh, which was right before yeah. thriller. Yeah, or, or right. Billie Jean from Thriller. I think Billie Jean is from Thriller. Is it? I'm pretty, pretty sure that it is. Thriller off the wall is Rock with You, which yeah. was that's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And well, then, Billie Jean is very similar to that though. I mean, it, well, you know, know, there's, there's a lot of progression through that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, thriller produced what eight singles or something? Yeah, uh, it was an ungodly number. So yeah, I right. mean, basically everything from the mid '80s. Is if you like thriller. Michael Jackson, he is, and probably musically, it, it's a valid uh, uh, statement. Uh, thriller is one of the one of the all around best albums you'll find uh, as far as quality music on all the tracks mm-hmm. uh, whether it's your music or not now I, I think I mentioned this last time we talked about this but you know I asked the boy what's your favorite best all round album ever what is the answer Synchronicity by the Police gee I sense some influence here I did not I did <laughs> you not you did not you did he not came load to that the, conclusion you on his own plant that seed you did and not it, load the jury <laughs> I did not stack the jury I did not but he came to that on his own. And I tell you what, I was never prouder than at that moment. I, I no, must say that's that's uh, true. But you know, you look at uh, bands that are influential, it change things. You know, they didn't necessarily change anything, but they that's one band that stands out for uh, both craft and ability. But also, it's a three man band. That's nearly unheard of. Mm-hmm. And yeah, depending on what they were doing when they got bigger, they had some background. Uh, pieces, but for the formative parts of their career, it was a three band, yeah. three man band. Well, and their their landmark again for being one of these bands that melds other types of music into yep. rock. Yep. They're they're grafting. They reggae. started out as an alternative new wave band. Yeah, they're, right. they're yep. grafting reggae. They're mm-hmm. grafting ska onto pop music, and and. Coming out with something very different in right. the end, and you know, for the most part, uh, you know, there's there's real lyrics there. There's you know, they're not songs that are you know the same three or four lines repeated over and over. Which I grant you, you know, as much as I love Susie and the Banshees, there are some songs where there's just not a whole lot of content there. Yeah. As much as I love them and I like to listen to them, it's like you know, they don't take me a whole lot. You know, uh, some early Eurythmics, same way. You know, yeah. there's another uh, band that is you know two people. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I mean, they're taking even one step further. <laughs> well, yeah, well, but an incredible voice too. But that's, incredible, yeah. yeah. Well, and that's the thing; it's that's, incredible talents. Well, that's that's uh, exactly in yeah. all cases. Yeah. <coughs> and, that's, uh, and that's what Jimmy Page uh, yeah. and Robert Plant, yeah. uh, and um, uh, Sting. You know, his voice is, is very distinctive in, yes. in many respects. Ways those vocalists, well, you too. You, you mean, Bono, that's what it means. Good voice. I mean, yeah. it's he's fantastic. You know, that. these are uh, bands that they don't tip things over in the same way that that we were talking about with Led Zeppelin mm-hmm. or, or Elvis and Nirvana. But 
they take the game and they really ratchet it up. They yeah, perform. perform. They are they are consistent and they they bring home the bacon every time. Well, it, yeah. Well, and their you know, albums coming out are important. Well, they're important, but they're also a progression of goodness. You know, uh, this, again, this is a common theme for us. You know, we we see guys that are uh, or women that are so good and they just keep getting better and better. And that's always a pleasure to, to, to see. Mm-hmm. You know, I always point out uh, Stephen King as a writer mm-hmm. and his progression in the craft. Uh, any any number of the musicians that we've talked about here today and in, in the past and, uh, you know, actors and actresses that we've talked about, all of them that keep coming up, they may not tip over the cart in the same way, but they move it along in such a way that it's, you know, they push everybody constantly. Yeah. And anyway, they're, just they're even more important than the Nirvanas and the, the Elvises and the Led Zeppelins in the sense that all of those that, that I just mentioned, they had a particular point in time where they were ex- extremely important. And then for the most part, well, for Nana, Nirvana, they don't, obviously it's not, they're not a factor for very long because Kurt Cobain commits suicide. He's at the height of his game, and he commits suicide. Mm. Well, I mean, there's, there's a lot of misery there. There's, there's a lot of misery there. So his there, angst was real. There and there's there's precedent for that unfulfilled genius. You know, well, again, that's the, you know the the Elvis the, dies young, Hank Williams dies young, and yeah. they're, they're, they're that that plays into that. Hendrix mystique. Morrison, correct? Yeah, yeah uh, there's many uh, Joplin, 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 Joplin. Yeah, yeah, all, all, all those, the whole uh, age twenty seven thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know whether it's uh, you know the Big Bopper and those guys in the the plane crash Buddy Holly, or yeah. Buddy Holly, yeah. uh, Richie Valens, uh, or the drug induced ones. You know, there's you know, obviously the plane crash is a little bit more accidental. I mean, you can make the argument the drug drug in, induced ones are as well, but you still have to choose to do the drugs. Right. Yeah. There's a, there's uh, but what drives there. you to that? But these guys though that stick around and have a longevity. They're not a flash in the pan, whether it's because they're a one-hit wonder or because uh, they, they their career comes mm-hmm. to an end tragically. They are important because they continually push the quality boundaries. They can, they can pick up a movement and carry it forward and, and, like you said, prove it's not just this one moment in well, time. Well, yeah, because they're, they, they are an thing. artistic, creative force. They can build up. Yeah. And you know, something that you've, you've kind of talked about there, all these people you're talking about, as a general rule, write their own material. Yes. That's, yes. There's a creativity that is yeah. baked into those successful stories yeah. that is, in many respects, what is what makes them great. Yeah. I mean, I know that there are many in, in the music industry, and Nashville, country music is famous for this, you have folks that they, what they do is write, and they find yes. the artist that fits them. They write for that artist, and the artist decides, this sounds like me, I'll record it. Most of the artists in country music don't write their own stuff, whereas in rock music... Well, nobody can have, can have lives that miserable and still be able to function. <laughs> There's a whole industry of writers right. in Nashville. Your dog can only leave you so many times. That's right. Uh, I, and your pickup truck can break down only so many times. Well, I wish I could convince you all of the great writing that does exist within the country music genre. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, there are many Chris Christopherson, hello. I'm a huge fan. Yeah. He was the guy writing you know, like, that That stuff. always amazes me because he just doesn't seem like the guy that would be in your wheelhouse. But it's, it's the angst. I mean, listen to a song like Sunday Morning Coming Down. Mm-hmm. About you see that's being why so messed up that you spend Sunday morning on the sidewalk wishing God you were stoned. Well, I mean, that's I'm surprised that you don't like Hank Williams because oh, that's well, I, I was gonna say I because I, he I'm is that see, I'm a Cephas guy. Yeah, too. well, I'm speaking senior. Oh yeah, here. he's he's great. Too. He was the one that did it first, the best. Yeah, yeah not yeah. the first, but but pretty I, much the best. I mean, but those guys again, songwriting I love. Anybody, yeah. whatever genre it is, yeah, my gosh, if you're a those songwriter. Guys. I'm probably going to be all up in it. I love songwriting and I love musicianship. So yes, I have a bit of a schizophrenic playlist. You know, well, I do too. And it's hey, it's and I'm totally cool with I that. Mean, yes, it's Black Sabbath, and then the next song I might listen to is, you know, Hank Williams Jr. Hank Williams Jr. or, um, you know, again Chris Christopherson or, you know, The Police. Yeah, uh, well, you know, or something. Great. I, I am probably the 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 least varied. In our music, even though modern, more 
generally speaking, off the wall, although we are now old enough to where, you know, some of the stuff that even I listen to has made its way to Muzak. Oh, yeah. I was, in Kroger, you hear Elvis Costello on the Muzak in Kroger. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's just something wrong with that. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, either somebody has sold out or you no longer have control of your music catalog. Yeah. You know, yeah. one way or another. There's, there's a lot of that exactly going on. exactly where my playlist will go. I mean, one moment it's, you know, it's, yeah. it's Paranoid from Black Sabbath. The next minute it's, it, it's Allison. Yeah. From, from uh, Elvis Costello. And yeah, I, I mine like is it. mostly the, you know, that alternative new yeah. wave punk you're, stuff from the late 70s, early yeah, or to the 80s. Yeah, kind of a new romantic guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're OMD and... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, sign anything soundtrack from John Hughes' film. You know, yeah. uh, that kind of stuff. But, you know, that's because a lot of it was uh, was also... In, the movies were influenced by some of those songs, but also the actors, the young actors... In those movies, oh, yeah. influence what music was part. Oh of. yeah, they loved that, and they they encouraged the, the Hughes to put it in. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for God's sakes, there's an entire movie based on a psychedelic first song, you know, "Pretty in Pink," which I tell you, the, the original version it's a much rawer, uh, rougher. Uh, I don't say necessarily authentic, but it's just not. It's before they were as polished as they are now. Yeah, not as produced. Yeah. And you can you can tell the difference, which just goes to like show us. you. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but it just goes to show you that that's another band. You know, they still tour. Well, yeah, we saw them, uh, yeah. and we saw them uh, Memphis. in Memphis, and then a uh, year and a, two years later, I saw them with uh, Mrs. Robert. And if they come around again, I will go see them again mm-hmm. because they're one of the best bands live I have ever seen. Uh, Their it. music, because most bands, especially in the '80s, live did not sound like. They did. They were studio the wizards. Yeah, they were studio wizards. Yeah, because you can. Because that's when playing with the music really got good. When you could take somebody who was mediocre and make them into somebody who was really phenomenal. And you know, you choose one of those bands that sounds just as good live as they do. Well, uh, because it's the talent they bring. Right. That's those four guys. They they're just oozing with talent. Exactly. To the point they can just do anything. They are real it sounds musicians. Good. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. yeah, real musicians. That's probably a very good way of yeah. putting it. The Police, when they uh, toured, um, gosh, what was it? How long ago was that? It's a long time. Was it a decade? It's been at least ten years. I think. Yeah. Um, no, we caught them like in the middle, early to mid part of their tour when yeah. they came here to, to Louisville. And I mean, other than Sting not being able to hit the highest notes quite like he used to be able to. They were just as good. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, Copeland and Stewart, uh, Stewart um, Summers. Summers, yeah. Uh, Copeland and Summers are very good musicians yes. in their own right. Um, and usually, when you when you have that, even if a band doesn't survive and, and splits, real musicians go on to continue making tremendous music. Yeah, Stuart Copeland is a uh, is a whiz at music soundtracks. Yeah, uh, he, he did the for movies. He did the, for pilot, the pilot for Babylon 5. Yeah. It sounds very different uh, than where the series eventually ended up, so much so they had to go back and redub it with new music because it just didn't fit when they re-released yeah. it. Did you guys uh, see the, uh, the the Grammys where the police got back together and made the announcement that they were going to go on tour again? I remember it. I don't think I saw it. Okay, Not so live. I saw it live. Yeah. And... It was it was great first of all because it was the freaking police and they were playing again. They yeah, because they hadn't again. done that in since eighty six. Yeah, I was gonna say. So you're talking at the at the 20, latest twenty years. Yeah, a bit of it. Uh, oh, more than that. That's more than that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you're talking twenty five. Uh, probably closer to twenty to twenty five. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it was great watching it because if you if you pay attention to what's going on, Stewart's the drummer and he's in the back. Mm-hmm. He was having the most fun I've ever seen somebody have <laughs> playing the drums. I mean, it was like watching Animal. I mean, he okay. was so he just... energetic. But because he was so ramped up, I think he was the one who was the most excited about yeah. the three of them getting back together. Yeah. Because they and he that. had a successful career. I have no idea what Andy Summer was doing while the Sting and, and Stuart were off doing their stuff. But, you know, it's not like Stuart Copeland was needing the money. He was he was He's a successful busy, yeah. music, musician on his own, not obviously to the extent that Sting was, but he was so excited to be back together with his guys. Yeah, and, and that they, was a joy to see. Apparently, they got along more or less. They did more, more or, or less. less yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, you spend that much time doing that much work uh, together, and you know, it's rock. You got egos. Yeah, and yeah. you know, Sting wanted to do different stuff. I mean, he went very mellow. 
after the, his first solo album, which was very much a police-like album. Dream of the Blue Turtles. Dream of the Blue Turtles. Great album, by the way. Very it was. Great album. Yeah. It was honestly the only one that I really liked. I mean, Mrs. Roberts, she loved his follow-on stuff. It didn't speak as much to me because it was a lot more mellow. Some of it's really great. Well, he's, he's got the voice. He can... He does. He, he has he, a great voice. He can, becomes kind of that Kenny G jazz influence. Yeah. Well, he's kind of like Rod Stewart in a way. He's got this ability to just lay it out there that you can't not listen to. It doesn't matter what he sings. He's more polished. He has more polished voice than Rod Stewart. Well, yeah, Rod still sticks to the to the rock side mostly. Well, he always but... sounds like he's, you know, gargling gravel at times. Who? Stewart? Yeah, uh, no, Rod Stewart at times. Sometimes. But, you know, he did a, a wonderful uh, collection of, like, Sinatra stuff. Because he's a crooner. Yeah. Stewart yeah. is a crooner. Uh, at a heart, and he, of course, he's. I don't know how old Rod Stewart is now, but he's got to be eighty, uh, and he still does whatever you know. He's Rod Stewart; he can do what he wants to. Uh, but he has been able to show himself as doing these Sinatra and uh, Mel Torme and stuff like that. And it was a gazillion seller. It was yeah. a gazillion seller. Part of that's he's got he the because he, he's got the that guy that presence. got him a look. But you know, he brought home the bacon. He sang the the material and did a great job and broadened his audience because. A lot of the folks that love that music, they don't know Rod Stewart. And don't, no, and they're no. not gonna not gonna buy it. Um, He's a guy with big hair. Why would they do that? Yeah, but they did then. So there's only one more I want to throw out here because I know we're, we we hit the hour mark. But yep. um, uh, just one thing I want to throw out because he's a standout, and his music catalog was just sold to Warner Brothers, and that's David Bowie. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, you, you have to. You, I mean, we have to. He's he's in a pantheon. Uh, a musician gods for a lot of reasons, not just the quality, but the length of his career, the risks he took. Yes, uh, yes. yeah, because he should not have been able to succeed with those in many respects. But uh, you know, my favorite is still was... the Laughing Gnome. Really? Yes, because uh, it's just so whimsical. Well, I mean, that's, I, and I just love he that. Really whimsy. is what you we somebody who transformed from Ziggy Stardust. To that early '80s stuff, yeah, well, he's teaming up with Mick Jagger, and they're doing "Dancing in the Streets." You know, yeah. that's that's a very different type of. Well, music. he did a little bit of acting. You know, I think we talked about him a bit the last time we did music, but yeah. since we're talking about game changing, yeah, kind of kind of thing, he, he's a, he is a landmark, very important he, performer. He is, and yeah. you know, he was even doing music up, up near the end uh, before he passed. Unfortunately, uh, any of them that passed passed too early. But he did have a really good career and yeah. just produced a ton of really good music. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he was very good at it. Well, one last salute, somebody that we also talked about uh, that has recently passed that I don't think we've mentioned up to this point, but is, again, a, an important performer, is Charlie Watts. Uh, oh, yes. yeah, we, we, we had... We were going to talk about the Rolling Stones. We'll have to save that for uh, yep. for Rock Bands 3, perhaps. Yes, yeah, because uh, there's still more, because I haven't talked well, yeah. about Metallica or ACDC yet. Yeah, that well, we, we got... Well, we, we did it briefly, only because I mentioned that, that ACDC was my first concert. There you go. Uh, I think I mentioned that the last well, time. Well, you know, the best part about ACDC is uh, somebody criticized them as being, well, all your songs sound the same, and the, the response is, no, they all sound like ACDC songs. In other <laughs> words, we have an, an identity that's right, that right. We, are, we stay with. Well, you know, and, and that's and true, their, I think, for Their most... album sales and their concert sales support that yeah. Yeah. as a success. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, like, sir. And I think that's true for a lot of the bands that we personally listen to, whether it's Susie and The Cure or David Bowie, even for the changes they've all gone through their career, yeah. you hear those first few no- notes or a line, and you know from what it is who, you know, oh, this sounds, oh, it is. Yeah, this is. You know, and, and that's that's a tremendous thing when you have somebody who has a long career and yet, and you know, transforms throughout the career and grows and what have you, but still maintains the identity. Yeah. Uh, so that that's always this is, an amazing. This is thing. who we are. Yeah, you know, we we still didn't get past the early nineties for the most part. Uh, but uh, but what is there to do, Pat? Again, I, I mean, like, really, there's not. Like, in my opinion, I, I, once I'm you get the boy bands, I think the, it sucks. The last new album I bought was probably Stadium Arcadium, Red Hot Chili Peppers. Okay. I don't have know. I listened to it since two thousand one. No. Yeah, I don't know. I may have bought. Uh, I mean, I, I bought bands compilation discs. Since yeah, then, yeah. But um, as far as new music, I, don't, I can't think of anything I bought since then. The Cure's Blood Flowers maybe was the last new one because I think that was in the two thousand early two thousands. Um, 
Because by then it was, you know, because even by then you were able to listen to stuff on Napster and mm-hmm. uh, what have you, and everybody's ripping stuff and uh, what have you. But yeah, dogs uh, and cats living together, in mass hysteria. Well, I tell you what, for the music industry, it was. It was. That's right. Uh, yeah. They've adapted. But you know what's interesting? Uh, just last thing, since we talked about performers, uh, but we have also talked about the streaming, mm-hmm. and somebody was complaining. I can't even remember where I was having this conversation or watching it play out, but you know, you know, all the, especially the artists are all about you know quality of outcomes, and equity is the new buzzword. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, you know, I noticed on the Grammys, not everybody got a, an award. We don't necessarily want equity there, now do we? Because you know, they used to complain about the record companies controlled everything and yeah. how only a small number of companies, a small number of groups, made all the money. Yeah. Well, now we've opened it up to streaming so that everybody has a shot, whether it's on YouTube or Spotify or whatever. Yeah. Your music is out there. Yeah. Now, I mean, if you can play and record a video, you can put it on YouTube and gain a following. Yeah. But it's even more concentrated, it seems, uh, according to what you know. You see on the, the who, who makes the money and what gets played the most. Mm-hmm. It's even more... Con- oh, you know what it was? I think I might have been watching like a Ben Shapiro uh, video, uh, which probably has just lost half our audience, if they even know who that is. Uh, but they were talking about how streaming has just magnified because, you know, we have democratized music. Yeah. But yet, still the same people are making all the money. Which, as he was pointing out, what it is, is that talent has won. Quality yeah. has won. Yeah. Merit has won. Shouldn't that be what we strive for? As a consumer, don't we want the best? Well, as a consumer, but when you're on the bottom, or you think you are, because you know, I find it hard to believe that this rapper making $50 million a year is really oppressed. But, you know, when you perceive yourself as the bottom or want to be seen as the bottom, no, we, we want more of that equity, equality of outcome. But that's not what consumers want. We want it to be good. And that's what we look for. You know? We want what appeals to us. Right. Yeah, what, what speaks to our experience or our whatever. Sometimes. It's also, we love craft, too. We're willing to... If well, we, that, if that something, speaks to us. I mean, yeah. That's right. I mean, so I don't listen to a whole lot of Hendrix, but I, or uh, Eric Clapton, you know, two of the greatest guitarists. Yeah. You know, different kinds of guitarists, right. but yeah. but two of the greatest guitarists you will find. Love Clapton, yeah. And yet, I, I mean, they're not the only things I listen but I recognize the great quality. That's right. Yeah. And they're out there. Yeah. And the, yeah, that's what I, all the ones we've talked about today uh, is they have quality. And if they had, some of them, if they'd lived longer, who knows what would have happened. There well, you know. eventually they get fat and addicted to barbiturates and die on the toilet. I knew he was going to go there. <laughs> Probably. Well, <laughs> you know, some good. variation. You know, I mean, if Kurt yeah. Cobain had not committed suicide by gun... He probably would have committed suicide by some other way. Well, he actually was in fairly poor health. Oh, was uh, he? Um, a lot of stomach problems. Now, how much of those stomach problems are brought on by heroin abuse and which are other things? But he, he was in a great deal of pain. Uh, he did have a lot of issues, health issues. Um, he tried to medicate them himself rather than... Uh, listen to medical advice. Well, you know, that's the bane of most people. They try to self-medicate yep. uh, serious issues with things that only temporarily take the pain away. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just to uh, follow on to that, um, speaking of, of, you know, survivors and going past and, and Kurt Cobain, um, Dave Grohl, of course, moves out of Nirvana to found Foo Fighters. Uh, has written a book and oh, Ivar yeah. bought a copy already and the boy is reading it yeah he got it for Christmas yeah yeah um, uh, what's it called again um, I cannot remember the name but of course you know Grohl's very close to his family and yeah I think that figures it's into a very it. short title yeah and then so um, you know this should be pretty interesting yeah, yeah. I, I uh, like Mrs. Robert that. and uh, her friend uh, uh, Trish are supposed to go see the Foo Fighters they were supposed to go before everything happened yeah, with shutting down and all that, and I think they're I think it's August is when they're going to be touring again, where they yeah. can go see them. Yeah, yeah. Like so. so yeah, the Dave Grohl book and and Ivar has a copy as well. So 
Awesome news. Awesome yeah. news. It was like, you bought a book? He, yeah. You're not a book guy. Yeah. So, Wait, a book? Me like a real book? Yeah. <laughs> so, but he, that's, you know, he, he loved Dave Grohl and well, good. he wants to read all about it. Good, and, good, and good. That'll good. be a lot of that history of, of Nirvana. You know, that's always good. I mean, not that specifically, but it's always good to, to learn more about what has gone before. Indeed. So, Francis. Next time we're going back to history, guys. And we're continuing. Are we going to go medieval on y'all? I've been waiting to say that. Okay? It gets, it's, yeah, good. good. No, I, I like it. I like it. Your Marcellus Wallace is on point. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's right. Because we're going to talk Middle Ages again. And one of my favorite subjects, actually, I've been doing a lot of research on this. I think I'm captaining. I don't know. It's the Crusades. There you go. It's something that strides like a colossus over the period and affects so many things. It deserves some oh, it, scrutiny. It strides not, like a colossus not just over the, the period of the time, but today still. Oh, that's right. It still has repercussions yeah. today. So, of course, we need to talk about that. So, that's where we're going next time. Hope you enjoyed another pointless discussion of eternal questions. Remember, new episodes publish every Friday at noon Eastern. Spread the word. We're on all the major podcast platforms. And leave us a comment or review because that helps others find us. We're on Instagram, Twitter, as well as our website, snakesandotters.com. I'm Martin. And I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. Join us next week. Same snake time, same otter channel.